It's great to be here. It's nice to uh, visit Shenzhen, which I have not been to before, although I've been many times in China. And I'd like to talk to you today about the research that we are doing at New York University, which uh, measures the risk in the banking sector around the world and ask, how does China look from this perspective? So uh, when we talk about financial stability, we have a very important context in mind. That is, we realize that the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009 showed us that the failure of the financial system can have massive real effects on the real economy and that these effects can last many years. We are coming up to the five-year uh, anniversary of the failure of Lehman Brothers and it's not at all clear that the global economy has recovered from this crisis. In addition, we are now seeing a second global financial crisis, which in this case we call the sovereign debt crisis, which is uh, primarily affecting Europe. And this has also had major economic, real economic effects. In the face of these two events, we have to ask, how do we foresee such risks and how do we prevent them going forward? Well, it's not so easy to prevent risks as you can imagine from this little picture. What we saw when we looked, when we looked back at the events just five years ago is the Lehman's bankruptcy was really the beginning of the worst part of the financial crisis. And many people say, oh yes, that could have been avoided if we had only rescued Lehman Brothers and not let them fail. But we forget the other things that were happening at the same time. It turns out this same week corresponded to the the nationalization of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It corresponded to the bailing out of Citibank, the Bank of America, rescuing of Merrill Lynch. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were rescued. AIG was rescued. WAMU and Wachovia were subsequently purchased and failed on their own, and many more. This was not a single isolated bank that got into trouble, Lehman Brothers. This was what we call not a domino effect, where one firm falls and it knocks another one down. This we call a tsunami, that there was a wave of financial distress which hit all the banks at the same time. I think what we learn from looking at the financial crisis is that it's when the banking sector as a whole that's weak that we have the potential for a big and serious financial crisis. What about China? Well, China is the second largest economy in the world and has one of the largest exchange, foreign exchange reserves. It has an amazing record of growth. It has a stable and forward-looking political system and a carefully managed economy. However, its banking system and slow-moving state-owned enterprises pose a risk. So we want to look at how these risks appear from the point of view of our systemic risk measures. I'm going to define a measure of what we call systemic risk and give it a name. We call it S-risk for systemic risk. And this is a risk which is measured for an individual financial institution, one at a time, and then aggregate it up. So here's the question that I want to ask you and that we are going to ask over and over and over again. How much capital would a financial institution need to raise 
in order to be able to function normally if we have another financial crisis. Every financial institution needs a cushion to protect it from a bad economic period going forward, and is that cushion adequate to protect it from something like the financial crisis? This is a number that we can measure in dollars. It's a measure that we calculate every week, and it's a measure that we post on the internet, and you can see it if, you've, if you're connected to the internet, you can see it from here and see what the results are today. I uh, checked it in my hotel room this morning because today is Monday and we re-estimated these models yesterday. So we have new numbers subsequent to what's actually on the, on the slides here. So let me tell you sort of how it works. Bank of America is obviously a large U.S. Uh, bank. It has a market capitalization of $141 billion. Its accounting liabilities are $2.0 trillion, much larger than its market cap. The market cap is the value of its equity, outstanding. We call this the leverage ratio of 14.9. That is, its liabilities are approximately 15 times its assets. If we have another financial crisis, which is assumed to be a fall of 40% in the global equity markets, the value of the market cap of Bank of America will go down. We estimate how much it will go down based on looking at the volatility and correlation of Bank of America stock with other, uh, with the broad stock market. We use something called a dynamic conditional beta, which turns out to be approximately one today. So for every 1% the global market goes down, Bank of America stock will go down, we think, by 1%. Therefore, the leverage is going to go up in a, down, in a uh, financial crisis, and Bank of America would need to raise capital in order to function in a normal sort of way. We estimate 91, 92 billion is what would be needed. This uh, estimate is, uh, I don't know, maybe a month or two in the past. So this is sort of how it works. But let me give you a second example just to show uh, what Oops, uh, just to show that not all banks look the same as Bank of America. Credit Agricole, which is one of the leading banks of France, has a market cap of 23 billion and liabilities of about the same, 2.2 trillion. So it has a leverage ratio of about 100 to one. This is a bank that is very close to bankruptcy if the French government were not to uh, rescue it. Any change in asset or liabilities uh, or changes in the global stock market would very dramatically affect the, uh, the capitalization of credit agricole. And it is uh, therefore in a relatively precarious position. Presumably, a bank like Credit Agricole is desperately trying to conserve its capital, make only the most secure loans, and build up its balance sheet in order to reduce its, uh, its risk in case of a uh, global stock market collapse. So this measure of S risk, we think of as a measure of systemic risk. But Let's try to ask, why is this a measure of systemic risk? If any firm, such as Credit Agricole, has a high value of S risk, it means it is vulnerable to a run or to a collapse in the global financial markets. Therefore, it's likely to try to improve its capital position, either by selling equity or by re improving the quality of its balance sheet paying off some of its debt, and, and making fewer new loans. 
A single firm can do this, but if the entire sector has high S risk, it becomes, uh, it's a process which starves the real economy of credit. And as the real economy has re insufficient credit, it begins to slow down. As the real economy slows down, the stock market goes down, and we see the beginning of this credit cycle, the beginning of this financial crisis happening just as all these banks seek to improve their balance sheet. This turns out to be a spiral. Investors recognize the weakness of the financial institution because the real economy is collapsing and they will reduce their valuation of the banks, raising S risk even further. And bankruptcies and other failures are the end product of this spiral until eventually the return to capital looks high enough to encourage new money. However, there is a solution to this, which is if taxpayers are willing to bail out these financial institutions, then the spiral can be stopped before the bottom. However, if taxpayers do this, this will further erode market discipline and reduce the, uh, the cautious nature that banks should traditionally have and encourage them to take further risk today if they expect to be bailed out. The primary solution to this problem is therefore regulation. We must have firm and adequate and uh, careful regulation in order to uh, prevent this kind of spiral from happening. Ideally, this kind of regulation would be countercyclical in nature so that you would impose it more strictly when the economy is strong and the bank balance sheets are strong and then back off in the regulatory restrictions when the economy is weaker. So here's a graphic about this. So this is a banker who is on the top of a bank building and he says, I'm okay, I landed on a taxpayer. <laughs> he was bailed out just in time before he hit the ground. So why would any bank have a positive S risk if they knew what I'm telling you? Well, one thing is this is an externality. We think that if a single bank has positive S risk, they will be able to build up their balance sheet, they will be able to sell assets and improve their, uh, their financial strength. So there may be a race to see which bank it is has the high leverage and the high risk. We call this an externality in economics so that uh, it, it makes it clear why banks would uh, rationally think that they were the only ones that are taking this high leverage and therefore uh, uh, make a, f uh, a faulty decision to, to, uh, to build up their risk. Second of all, there are implicit and explicit government guarantees such as deposit insurance or too big to fail guarantees that would lead to taking on this kind of risk. Thirdly, there may well be regulatory incentives that encourage investments that might not otherwise be prudent. It turns out that the, that the Basel risk weights that are used for calculating the the capital that a bank needs treated most of the assets that got banks into trouble as riskless. And this is uh, not unheard of. It's, it is also true of the sovereign debt crisis that we're seeing now and uh, could be uh, true in future uh, economic crises as we will mention in a minute. And then of course there's the possibility that banks miscalculate. Securitized products are a good example. It's very difficult to effectively measure the risk of these complicated securitized products, and I think it's, it's 
easy to say that most of the banks that bought mortgage-backed tranche securities during the financial crisis and before it were completely unaware of how much risk they actually entailed. So how do we actually measure this S-risk number? I could spend some time on this, but I don't suppose that many of you are econometricians who are interested in the time series subtleties of what we're doing. Basically, we know that volatilities and correlations are continually changing over time, and so the impact of the global equity market on an individual company's stock is changing as its volatility and correlations change over time. Effectively, we can build a model which describes how this changes over time and looks at the current values, the current best estimates of what the beta would be. And this is a method we call dynamic conditional beta, and it's a generalization of the Garch models, it's a generalization of the dynamic conditional correlation model, and it actually has a copula involved in the background as well. Uh, these methods take account of heavy tails and changes in market conditions. So that's all I'm going to say about the econometrics. So let's take a look at what we see. And what we see is in, shown on the website VLAB. And here's the, here's the URL. And what we do is we calculate for 1,200 financial institutions around the world what the S-risk is for each institution every week. We do it, the calculation on the weekend. And at the moment, we're using something called a nested dynamic conditional beta model with a first order moving average model to estimate the beta. So if we add up all the capital that would be needed for this whole 1,200 firms around the world, we get an estimate of how much capital would be needed to bail out the entire world's banking sector if we have another financial crisis. So here's a picture of what that number looks like over time. And it's over the last five years. So we're starting at the, basically, the beginning of the worst part of the financial crisis on the left-hand side of this graph, and going through a quiet period uh, from in 2010 and the first part of 2011. And then, interestingly, the risk, the global risk, went back up again in the summer of 2011. In fact, if you look at this chart, you'll see it's just about as high at the top of, at the summer of 2011 as it is, uh, was during the peak of the financial crisis. And since then, the global risk has declined. The last number on there is about $3 trillion. So that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. The US bailout was $700 billion the Chinese uh, foreign change reserves are about $3 trillion, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Where is this risk? Well, here is how it's spread across countries. You can see that the country with the highest S risk is Japan. Japanese banks do not have an adequate financial cushion, and the main way we understand that is that Japanese banks hold a great deal of sovereign debt, Japanese sovereign debt, which has lost value in the marketplace. And as it loses value, the market cap falls for these banks, and they, their risk looks uh, like it's increased. However, you see that the number two country on this list is now China. Three is United States, and then France, then UK, and so forth, on down this list. The last time I was in China was in June, and I showed this, uh, oh, sorry. I showed this graph, and at this time, China was number three. United States was number two. So in the meantime, China has increased its S risk, and the United States has reduced it. That's in three months. If you look at these 
at numbers relative to GDP, you get a sense as to how difficult it would be for the government to produce enough capital to uh, bail out its financial sector if necessary. And the top of this list is, uh, is now Switzerland and France and the UK. So you can see that Europe is in a situation where its banking sector is very vulnerable to, uh, to further collapse. And the amount of GDP that would be required to bail out these countries is extremely high. Behind these aggregate numbers are some interesting regional effects. Here is a chart which shows on the top what's happened to the US. And the US has gone from a peak of about a trillion dollars down to about, I think, uh, 350 billion, something like that. So there's been a substantial reduction in the risk of the banking sector in the US. The banks have built up their, their balance sheets, their equity values have gone up as a consequence, and their risk appears to be down. In Europe, you see that there was a recovery, then a further increase, and toward the right, it looks like there has been some improvement. Some people would identify that with Mario Draghi's comment, we will do what it takes. No one knows whether they should believe that as being sufficient, but it looks like it calmed the markets, and there is an improvement happening in Europe as well. The bottom one is Asia. And what you see is that the financial crisis in Asia, in the left hand of this graph, was not nearly as bad as in the upper two graphs. However, the right hand side is higher. Financial risk has increased in Asia while it's been decreasing in the rest of the, the world. Looking more specifically at Japan, you see a big increase through most of this period, but at the far right, there's some evidence that Japan is also stabilizing. This may be a vote in favor of Abe economics, which seems to have turned around the Japanese economy and reinvigorated both sovereign bond prices and uh, bank equity prices. And finally, let me show you China. So here is China. You can see China at the left had almost no S risk during the financial crisis. This is a tribute to the way the effectiveness of the banking sector in China. However, you can see that the rate of growth of S risk to the right hand side of this graph has been very dramatic. It's increased not without wiggles, but it has increased very substantially from the low periods in 2009-2010 to quite a, a large number today in uh, 2013. And this is just under $500 billion is the uh, number for uh, China today. In fact, when I looked at the, at the website this morning, it turns out that there is a slight improvement since last week in China. It's, uh, it's uh, maybe $10 billion better. Maybe you could see that on this graph, maybe not. But it's something that I would encourage you to pay attention to as we go forward in time. Look to see whether some of the reforms that are being done are actually being effective and showing up in improved uh, S-risk measures. We can look at more detail here, and here is a list of the most risky financial institutions in Asia. And as you can see on this list, which you probably can't really see, is the Japanese banks are at the top of the list. Mitsubishi uh, UFJ Financial Services, Mizohu Financial Group are the first two, and then Bank of China is number three. China Construction Bank, number four. Sumitomo is number five. Agricultural Bank of China, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China are the next two. 
So you can see that the Japanese banks are actually at the top, but the Chinese banks are close behind. The, the large four uh, state-owned Chinese banks are close behind. We can look on this website at the changes. And one of the things you can see is how the S-risk has changed for these financial institutions over the last year. And one of the things you'll see is that the Japanese bank's S-risk has decreased over the last year, whereas the Chinese bank S-risk have increased over the last year. We decompose that into changes in liabilities, changes in equity, that is the market cap, and changes in risk. And so you can tell a story about what has caused these changes in financial risk. If we look at the five-year changes, we can see, again, that all the banks have very substantial increase in their risk over the last uh, five years, both the Chinese and the Japanese banks. So there is a question that we have to ask, which is, does this methodology apply to China? This is a sort of a, a, a capital market type of analysis, and China isn't really in this mold. They're running their economy in a rather different way, and so we need to think about whether, how that would change our opinion about the importance of this result. So one of the things we have heard about a lot is the problem of Chinese municipal debt and state-owned enterprise debt. Is this a burden on the Chinese economy? Well, I think it's pretty widely recognized that this is a burden on the Chinese economy. In, a, uh, in an interesting uh, article uh, by Li Meng, we see that Chinese local government debt has increased dramatically since 2008, and much of this is from stimulus that was introduced, as we, as we know, in response to the global financial crisis, and much of it is a, indirectly financed by special purpose vehicles that have been set up by the municipal governments in order to make the uh, to make these loans possible. Of this large amount of debt, a great deal of it is coming due now or over the next uh, year or so. Will these loans perform? When we say, does a loan perform, we're asking, will the, will the Lend, will the institutions that take out the loan pay the interest payments, and will they return the principal when the time comes? And the answer is, we don't know for sure, but it looks pretty much like many of these municipal loans are not performing. Most of them have been restructured so that they're not currently due, but by restructuring them, it means that they're not paying the interest or the principal back to the, the state-owned banks, these loans are uh, just going to continue on the balance sheets of the banks, and they don't actually look like they're non-performing because they have been restructured. However, in an economic sense, they are non-performing loans. In addition to the loans to state and local governments, we have enormous loans to state-owned enterprises. The banks, I think rather naturally, feel like the safest thing to do is to loan to a state-owned enterprise if you're not going to loan to a municipal government because we're all owned by the same institution, which is the state. So this process of reducing risk by loaning to state and, and uh, state-owned enterprises is uh, 
providing massive amounts of credit, but it's not actually producing much economic outcome. And this is something that was discussed substantially in the previous panel, where it's this credit is being used to actually, in many cases, to, to buy land and is responsible in, in large measure for some of the increases in uh, land prices that uh, we're continually reminded about. So I'd like to um, now ask, how does this affect an investor in Chinese banks? If you own stock in a Chinese bank, how do you value these loans to state-owned enterprises? How do you value loans to municipal enterprises? Do you see these as risky or not? My guess is, as an investor, you probably don't think these are very risky because the most likely outcome is that those loans will be made whole by an injection of capital from the government. Okay. So the chances are that the discount that we saw for Japanese banks is not fully going to be shown up in Chinese banks. This means that our S-risk measures are likely to be underestimated in Chinese economy. So, um, let me just Remember for a moment why an institution might have a positive S risk. One answer is externalities. A second one is implicit and explicit government guarantees. In China, these guarantees are not implicit, they are explicit. There is no possibility that Chinese banks will be bankrupt. In fact, it's uh, exactly the opposite. And consequently, all the reasons why we think banks that are too big to fail take excessive risk are likely to apply in China, where banks that are government owned are likely to take excessive risk. Furthermore, regulatory incentives that encourage investments that might otherwise be prudent was an explanation for high S risk. Well, I think that is also a case in China where, where Credit expansion is actually part of public policy, and consequently, the loans that are taken are not the loans which are economically most sensitive, but the sensible, but the loans which are uh, dictated by other policy uh, objectives. And of course, miscalculation is there too. Okay, well, can China afford to recapitalize its banks? Unlike most of the other countries that have gotten into trouble, China has vast reserves. A 500 billion cost to recapitalize the banks is small compared to the three trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves that China has, and China can presumably uh, raise this capital by domestically selling bonds and might not have to even liquidate its foreign exchange uh, reserves. If it did try to liquidate its foreign exchange reserves, it would lose its ability to peg the renminbi and consequently is unlikely to try that route. However, a slowing economy means that there will be lots of, lots of claims on government resources. The banking sector is only one, but lots of other industries are going to seek help from the government. The state-owned enterprises, for example, and the municipal governments are going, to are going to put pressure on the government to provide resources for them as well. So my kind of concluding comment here, I think, is that systemic risk is maybe not so great today in China, but it's a rising concern. It's not that this can't be solved, but that it should be solved. It must be solved, and if it's solved in a sensible way, then this will actually be a, uh, a positive to Chinese growth rather than a negative that it can be if it spirals out of control. So when we ask what the prognosis is, 
Maybe this is the prognosis. It's the end of the bull. Or maybe this is the prognosis. <laughs> Dancing with Barack. <laughs> so let me stop here and invite you to my uh, favorite cafe, the Arts Cafe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.